Mariana almost missed the bus, but she's on her way. <laughs> That's right, she just turned five, didn't she? Wow. She already told me that she'll, she's looking forward to six. She said next is six. She's only got 360 days to wait. The word miracles has lost a lot of its meaning. That's what I want to talk to you about for a few minutes today, miracles. And you're saying, I know, I know, the Bible is filled with miracles from start to finish, and it is. But I'm going to talk about miracles for you in your life. Because this, this book is alive, and it's for us today. Right? Miracles. Sometimes, as I said, we, we, we have broadened the word so much that we use the term like, oh, it's a miracle. I only gained four pounds over Thanksgiving. Or, it'll be a miracle if the Bears make the playoffs. That, that, that would be a miracle. Or, or maybe... Um, Joanne will call me up and say, can you stop and buy some Miracle Whip on the way home? Miracles. Is that like mayonnaise or something? Something like that. In fact, that's what I would do. I'd go in the store and say, whatever Miracle Whip is, I want some. You know, I'm, I, don't do a lot of, I don't do a lot of shopping, but that's what we want. But in the meantime, there are miracles of supernatural brilliance and, and import. There are some things that we might call smaller miracles than others. When our daughter, one of our daughters was held up in Chicago and the person that held her up used a plastic gun but it looked real and, it, and it, the only thing he did was grab her necklace and run away. And we regard that as a small miracle because it could have been way worse, as you probably know. We've seen a whole number of what you might just call small miracles. Somebody, somebody in the world would say, oh, she was sure lucky, or, you know, fate was on her side. And the answer is no, God was on her side. <laughs> That's why she wasn't shot or worse and that happens all the time not only in Chicago but but here one of our daughters one time was with us and we were in a healing service and uh, I think I've shared this with you before but we had our hand raised during worship and just worshiping God and she said dad 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 my warts are gone. My warts are all gone. Anne had been teased for a long time about her warts. When she went to school, they, just called, they said, you must have toads at home or something. And you know how kids hurt kids. But God took them away during praise and worship. I forget what I was praying about or asking for, but that was a miracle, a, a, a big miracle, a huge miracle. I had an opportunity one time to be driving down 4th Street in Peru, and we had an old Suburban at the time, had a lot of miles on it, made a lot of noise, but it was big and bulky and, and everything. We needed it with uh, 13 or 14 children we had. Is that me? Well, eight children we had. But anyway, I was driving down 4th Street, and if you're familiar with where the Red Cross building is now, I can't remember the name of that street, but I was ready to turn down that street to go to 2nd Street where we live. And so I waited for the cross traffic to come, and then I turned the wheel to the left, and all of a sudden the Suburban stopped. And I went, oh no. The brakes locked up. I didn't touch the brakes. It just stopped. 
and I looked up over the hood of the car and there was a little boy walking across. He thought he didn't realize that I was going to turn. And he, I sat there long enough where he started across. And he looked up and said, Sorry, mister. And I said, Praise God. That's what I said. So there are miracles that happen. Dramatic, dynamic miracles like those. And I want to talk to you today about a particular miracle and tell you that how you can appropriate more miracles in your life. Before I do that, I just want to mention that a couple weeks ago when we had a young man that grew up in this church and he's now a missionary and came into our church and shared something. You're never too old or too young to learn. And he said that in Exodus 3, 13 and 14, it's the place where Moses went and, and asked the Lord in the burning bush, well, who should I say sent me? And the voice said, tell them I am that I am. Is that your name? I am that I am. And Tim Bayless said, he took it a step deeper. He said, did you realize what that is in Hebrew? If you break it down into the Hebrew language, it not only means I am that I am, and I've always existed and always will, but it also means that I am here for you. I am the God that will be. I have been and I will be and I will be here for you. Whatever you need, I will do that. I will be there for that. And your needs are probably like many of ours. I have a long list of, of needs. But these are the kinds of miracles that we can look forward to in our life. Lord, I need stronger faith. I need help to pay my debts. I need a new job. We're having marital problems, Lord. I need forgiveness. And I want to bring our family back together. We have some that are not as close to us as they used to be. I need a release from this depression. So many people these days, especially this time of year and right on through the first year, become depressed during the holidays. It's a hard time for them. Lord, I have diabetes. I have heart problems. I have arthritis. I've been abusing drugs or alcohol or whatever. I have a gambling addiction. I'm always stressful and anxious about things. Lord, I'm single and I need a Christian husband. I need a Christian wife. I'm afraid because I'm older and I, and I keep forgetting things and I don't want Alzheimer's or any of that stuff. You've got to help me, Lord. Sometimes I have nightmares, and there are many, many more. But remember, God already knows before you mention any of those things, he already knows what you need. He says, you come to me with those things, and I will be there for you. I will either help you get through, I'm going to heal you now, or eventually, or maybe not. Jesus said, Thy will be done, Father. Thy will be done. Jesus said, Not even my will, but your will, Father, be done. And we forget that part. We come to honor him. We know that he has the answer. And we don't have to go anywhere else. And one of the five word sentences that I live by is Jesus is all I need. Jesus is all you need for any of those issues that I mentioned for anything else. 
The biggest miracle I've seen in my life is in this church right now. My wife Joanne was healed of breast cancer and it only took seven years. When she went and was diagnosed, all of us, including myself, said yes. Her doctor in Peoria, Lynn Jalovich, who's that, that's what she does, is now just retired, and said we, we can take that tumor out and I don't expect any problems. Joanne said, I'll let you know. She went to a little country church that's over near Ottawa and um, went there every day for a week or so, spent the whole day there and on her face before God, said, should I have the operation or not? And God said, no, you won't need the operation. I'll take care of it. I'll be what you need. And Joanne said, okay. And nobody got on board with her. Her family, on our side, on her side, everybody that knew her, no, 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 you can't do that. So she started praying healing scriptures every day, day after day, day after day, day after day. She'd go back to see Lynn really once a month by, for early on, and Lynn said, after the second or third visit, I think it's getting, I think it's getting smaller. And then after a year, she said, I know it's getting smaller. And after two years, she said, it's really shrinking. It was this big, and now it's this big. Seven years every day. Healing scriptures. And I brought those healing scriptures that she said, because she had them written down, Little by little, she found these scriptures in the word for healing. And it's not only for dramatic healing like that, you guys. It's for any healing. It's for anything we need. I mentioned a couple of these things we need. But we also need emotional healing. We need mental healing. We need our minds renewed. Whatever we need, he is there to do it. He is there to do it. And I'm going to share some of those with you today. And then we'll be through. But I'm not, I can't, I don't have time to share them all, but I have a list. I took some of the healing scriptures that she uses, and there's two or three of them from Proverbs. What I'm going to do is give you one you're very familiar with, but one of the things that I want to do is go through them slowly because many times. When we read this word, we don't stop long enough to allow the Lord, the Holy Spirit, to translate it for us the way, the way we need. And this will be familiar with you, and it's Proverbs 4, starting in verse 20. My son, my daughter, my word should have your attention. My sayings will come into your ear. Not the sayings of men, not the cute little sayings that you have in every self-help book, not even what Lynn Jalovich says about your cancer. Listen to my words. Let them not slip out of your sight. Keep them within your heart. The Hebrew Translation says, engrave them on the tablet of your heart. It doesn't say write them on the tablet of your heart. If you write them in there, you might be able to erase them. But the Jewish people knew, if you do the study, word study in Proverbs 4, that if you engrave them on the tablet of your heart, the wind's not going to blow them away and they can't be erased. That's why you have to go slow. Let them not slip out of your sight. Keep them within your heart. They are life to those who find them. And to your whole being, they are health. Zoe, life. Zoe, health. And then 
Verse 23, with closest custody, guard your heart, for in it are the sources of life. This is the life that Jesus talked about. I have come to bring you life and bring it abundantly. That's the Zoe life of God. I have come to bring you the life that I have. And if you received him as your Lord and Savior, you have that living in you. That's in your spirit. That's his life. Some translations say the boundaries of your life. Or, or from your heart flow the springs of life. And when we talk about the heart, it's not, we're not talking about this physical heart. We're talking about the composite of your mind and your soul and your spirit. It encompasses all. It's kind of like the, the spiritual DNA. The spiritual DNA. Your heart. And you can say to somebody, I love you with all my heart. And if it's somebody that you really love with all your heart, they'll get the message. Because I love you with everything that I am. I love you with my mind, my body, my soul, my spirit. I love you, God. I love you, Joe, with all my heart. Another one of the healing scriptures, and this will bless you, I hope. This is another one. And it comes from Joshua 22. And in verse 44, it says, The Lord gave them peace on every side, just as he had promised their fathers. Not one of their enemies could withstand them. The Lord brought all their enemies under their power. Not a single promise that the Lord made to the house of Israel was broken. Every one was fulfilled. Did you know there's 3,000 or so promises in this book? And God has either fulfilled them already or will. Some of them are prophetic that will be fulfilled. But every promise has been fulfilled because in God's eyes, everything has already happened. He sees the beginning and the end. So he knows that that promise that you're hanging on to is going to be fulfilled. And it's not always fulfilled the way we want. Sometimes we'll pray for something our whole lifetime. And then maybe all at once it's fulfilled. Maybe on our deathbed, I don't know. Because God is sovereign. And we don't understand a lot of what he does. Or a lot of what he doesn't do. Lord, why didn't you step in and stop that car up there in, in Waukesha, Wisconsin, when that little boy was standing along the street looking at the Christmas parade and it hit him and killed him? Why didn't you stop the cancer from that seven-year-old boy in Peoria that just died after being prayed for from church from sea to shining sea in Peoria, a seven-year-old boy? died of cancer, very, a different kind of cancer. And God says in Isaiah 55, your ways aren't my ways. You don't understand. And we say amen to that. But every promise that he has made has been fulfilled. And it says here, to the house of Israel. And you're going to say, but wait. I'm not the house of Israel. Well, you are, because you have Jesus, a Jewish carpenter in your house, and you have the promises of Abraham, because in Colossians, excuse me, in Galatians, it says we are descendants of Abraham. But let me just tell you that over in the New Testament, it might make it a little bit easier to, for you to understand if you go to 2 Corinthians, because it took me a while to understand this. But if we go slow and let this grow and percolate in our hearts, it's going to be a lot easier for us to understand together today. Because this is for today. This is for us today. In 2 Corinthians 1, verse 20, all the promises God has made 
have been fulfilled in Jesus. All the promises have been fulfilled. Therefore, it is through him, Jesus, that we address our yea and amen to God, the Father, when we worship together, and our lives can be a worship, just because we're not singing or dancing right now, doesn't mean we're not worshiping him. God is the one who firmly establishes us in Christ. Christ, the word Christ, Christ comes from the Greek Christos, which means the anointed one, the anointed one. In Hebrew, it's Mashiach, Messiah. He has established us in Christ and, meaning the anointed one, and he has anointed us. And if you look that up in the Greek, it's exactly the same word. He has Christos us, anointed us, and sealed us, making the first payment, the spirit, in our hearts. So now we've established the fact that God doesn't change. His promises have already been fulfilled. He's on our side. He's here to help us. And we're on the victory side because we have been anointed with the same, anointed, same anointing Jesus had, exactly the same word. And we're thinking, how could that be? And I kept saying that for years. How could that be? How could that be? But do you believe that you asked Jesus to be your Lord and Savior? Yes. Then he came into your heart and he lives there. And the only way you can get rid of him is to kick him out saying, I don't believe. I believed all that stuff for a long time, but I don't believe. Because when you grieve the Holy Spirit, it's the unforgivable sin. It's written in here. You can do anything and I'll forgive it. But if you grieve my spirit, like, nah, I don't believe all that stuff anymore. I used to. I don't believe it all. And then you die. Adios. Just getting ready for Phil. He'll be coming in with Hispanic church. I don't know many words in uh, adios. Muy delicioso means very delicious. That's about it, my vocabulary. That's why he's never called on me to preach in his Hispanic church, among other things. Anyway, his promises have been fulfilled. Romans 8, verse 11, a very common verse, but God, but have we ever taken time to read it slowly and let it come into our heart and grow? How many times has pastor talked about a seed, the seed of faith coming into good ground and growing? The mustard seed becomes the biggest plant. The spirit of him, the breath of the Father, the Holy Spirit of him, the Father, who raised Jesus from the dead, dwells in you. He does? He does. How about that? Then he who raised Christ from the dead will bring your mortal body to life through his spirit dwelling in you. Okay, you got Jesus in your heart. The Holy Spirit is in there and sealed. And the Father made this promise through the Spirit. You know this, I hope you all know this Bible was written by God and not by men. That's one of the biggest uh, biggest lies that the liar of all lies, the defeated one. I call him the defeated one because he is the defeated one. We live in the victory side because Jesus said, all authority has been given to me. All authority has been given to me. All power has been given to me. How much power does Satan have? The, the, the defeated one, the wimp, the defeated one. None. He has no power. None. Zero. Zilch. Step on a mosquito. Get him out of your life. He has no power. 
And every time he comes around me, it's not the fact that I don't sin because I sin all the time, but every time he comes around me, I said, would you get out of here? You're wasting your time. I'm a king's kid. I've got Jesus inside of me. Take a hike. And guess what? He's thumbing his way out of Del Zell right about now. And you can do that. I don't spend a lot of time talking to him. It's not worth talking to. But he knows who I am. And in Psalms, God says, I will be an enemy to, excuse me, in Exodus, I will be an enemy to your enemy and a foe to your foes. I will be an enemy. Maybe I, <clears throat> maybe I didn't do it. Let me, let me just see real quick. Because I love this right here. In fact, this is one of the healing scriptures. And it may be in Deuteronomy. Let me just see. Deuteronomy. Anyway, it's in here. I'm not going to take time to look it up. Anyway, he says it. Let's go to the next one. We are pondering the words of Romans 11. His spirit dwells in us. In the book of Matthew, and these are all part of the healing scriptures, and starting in verse, uh, in chapter 18, chapter 18, verse 19. How many times have you heard this? Again I tell you, again I tell you, again I tell you, again I tell you, again I tell you. He's been telling Joanne and I this for years, and probably talking to you too, and sometimes we don't tune it in. We don't tune it in. If two of you join your voices on earth to pray for anything, it'll be granted you by my Father in heaven. Where two or three are gathered in my name, there I am in their midst. Yeah, but we've been praying for anything, all these things, for a long time, Lord. And he said, if it's in my will, Jesus said the Father told him that, if it's in his will. Maybe it's not in my will yet. Then maybe, well, it's, in, it's been completed. It's been completed because he promised. And also in the book of Matthew, in 21, 21, if you trust and do not falter, not only will you do what I did to the fig tree, but you say to this mountain, be lifted up and throw it into the sea, that will happen. You'll receive all that you pray for, Provided that you have faith. Provided that you have faith. You will get all that you pray for. What's the mountain in your life? The mountain in your life could be as insignificant as a little sore that, or crack here. You know how you get those cracks on your cuticle when it's real dry. I say, Lord, I need that to be healed. It's giving me a lot of pain. That's a little bitty mountain, more like a little hill. Cancer, breast cancer is a mountain. Breast cancer. But you might have some other mountains in your life. Selfishness. Stinginess. You feel unworthy. You doubt. You're in bondage to something. Many people are in bondage to their cell phones or television or movies or whatever. If there's anything that's more important in your life than God, then you're in bondage to it. But Jesus said, if you say to that bondage, go away, I'll take care of it. And he's done that for many, many, many people. Steve Chamberlain had a bondage to cigarettes. I had a bondage to alcohol. And those are all serious issues. But how did, they, how did they go? How were they taken away? Through the power of God. And he says, it's my will. Okay, you've waited long enough. I waited a while before I finally just gave up. And my wife gave up. She, I, she gave up. She said, I'm not going to pray for him anymore. 
And right after that, God started to work on my heart and Steve's heart. And then it was gone. Think of a mountain in your life. It doesn't have to be giant. It could be anything. And listen to that part where it says, provided you have faith. And I always ask the Lord, what kind of faith? And he says, my kind of faith. Yeah, but you're Jesus. What do you mean, your kind of faith? The same faith that I had in my father when I was walking around in flesh and blood is the same faith that you have in the father. Because in Mark 11, 22, Jesus said, put your faith in God. In the Greek it is, put your faith into God. And then again, I assure you that that mountain, and you have no inner doubts, and believe whatever you'll receive and ask for in prayer, it will be done for you. Lord, I need you to take this mountain out of my life. And you said that I could use your faith. And the question really is, do you think that Jesus can do it? That's what the question is. Not us. Because we can't get rid of it ourselves. There are many things in our life that we can't get rid of without faith. Duran couldn't get rid of that breast cancer without faith. I couldn't get rid of that little tiny... I was trying to think of the tiniest thing that I have. That started to hurt. and I started to pray about it and put some cream on it and now it's gone. Oh yeah, you can use the doctor. It's okay. You can go to the doctor. It's all right. It's all right. But we're talking about our part and God's part. We're talking about what should we do? What do we believe? And it's been proven that many people with sicknesses have been a lot better earlier if they're happy and they have faith and they believe than the people that don't have any happiness, the people that's given up, the people that don't have any hope, I don't know if, and, and the people that speak negatively, I don't know if I'll ever get better. No, you can't speak that way. I know that God's got it. I know this mountain's being taken care of. I believe, I believe, I believe. Lord, I know that you can do this. Do you believe Jesus can do it? The answer is yes. And of course, one of the main healing scriptures and believing in faith is found in Ephesians. And you're familiar with it, and if you're not, I hope you are. We say this every day. And by the way, it makes us sound like we pray all day. We don't. Joanne prays these healing scriptures, and I pray them most days. But we do put our armor of God on every day. And how long does it take? Three minutes? Stand firm against the tactics of the devil. Our battle is not against human forces, but against the principalities and powers, the rulers of this world of darkness, the evil spirits in regions above. You must put on the armor of God. This is what the Holy Spirit wrote. You must put on the armor of God if you are to resist an evil day. When's the evil day? Today is the evil day. You got it right. Do all your duty requires and hold your ground. Stand fast with the truth as the belt around your waist. The breastplate of righteousness. The zeal to propagate the gospel of peace as your footgear. Above all, take up the shield of faith. It will help you extinguish the fiery darts, the military strategies of the enemy. Take the helmet of salvation and the sword of the spirit, the word of God. Jesus is the word of God. The only offensive weapon we need is the sword of the spirit. The living word, he said, I am the living word. The sword of the spirit. The living word. Put on the armor. Have faith. Exodus 23. This is one of those promises. And I... I don't want to go too fast, but I, I don't want to go too slow. 
If you're writing them down, that's okay. If you're remembering them and just getting them in your heart, that's okay. So I was looking before. I thought it was in Exodus, and I changed my mind and went to Deuteronomy and couldn't find it. And it's because it's in Exodus. Exodus 23, verse 22. I will. I will. Where have you ever heard that before? I will be for you. I will be an enemy to your enemies and a foe to your foes. The Lord your God you shall worship. Oh, by the way, he won't do this automatically. You can't go home and burn your Bible and sit down and watch the NFL on CBS this afternoon and say, okay, God, I heard that message today in church. Go ahead and do all that stuff that that guy was talking about. Go ahead and do it. Uh Uh-uh. There's always something for us to do first. That's where our faith comes in. The Lord your God you shall worship, and then I will bless your food and drink, and I'll remove sickness from you, and I will give you a full span of life, and I'll have the terror of the enemy precede you. So I will throw into a panic every enemy you reach. Think of your enemies. Some of those enemies. No, they're not the Hittites and the Jebusites and the stalagmites and the, uh, all of those things. Stalagmites, that's not one of them. Anyway, it sounded good. And, and, but the enemies, what those enemies we have. I got a lot of enemies that, I, that I'm working on getting rid of. Maybe being more attentive to our children or being, being available to Joanne more often or being there when she needs me more often. She said, I need your help with something. I said, I'll be there in a few minutes. And I'm watching the last five minutes of the Ohio State-Michigan game. No, I'm working on that. If she said, I need your help, then I should turn off the Ohio State-Michigan game. That's a mountain. It's a small mountain. It's a small enemy to go and help her. And it's something easy. Do you mind running over to Anna's house and picking up something? They want, they're out of town. We've got to get their mail. Whatever it is. It's just doing what's right. Doing what you know is right. I will throw into panic. I will make all your enemies turn from you in flight. I will hand them over to you to be driven out of your way. Yes, Lord. Thank you, Jesus. There is something in Deuteronomy chapter 7. It just wasn't what I was looking for before. But in the book of Deuteronomy, and again, remember, Jesus Christ the same yesterday, today, and forever. So if we go to the Old Testament, these promises are still in effect. God promises are yea and amen through Jesus now, but they're still promises that he made to his people, and we are now his chosen people. In chapter 7 and verse 15, the Lord will remove all sickness from you and not afflict you with the malignant diseases that you know from Egypt, but leave them with your enemies. And let me, let me mention something here. When he talks about you know, Israel and Egypt, when you see Egypt in the Old Testament to bring it to life for you today, put in the world. The world. Our world. Because I don't have too much problem with Egypt, but I got plenty of problems with the world. And we can do that. Egypt is, I don't, I don't worry too much about Egypt. But I worry about where I am in this world. And this works for you. And when you see Israel, put your name in there. And I'll show you in a minute. I'll leave them with all the, I'll leave them with the world. You'll consume all the enemies which the Lord will deliver up to you through his strong hand and outstretched arm. 
So don't be terrified by them, it says in verse 21. For it is I, the Lord your God, who is in your midst, a great and awesome God, and I'll dislodge these enemies before you little by little. I'll deliver them up to you, it says in verse 23, and, and will rout them utterly until they are annihilated. Do you have sadness in your life? Do you have regret in your life? Do you gossip? Those are all enemies. And he'll take care of them for you. He promised. Lord, you promised that you would take care of it for us. And in chapter 20, it says, Hear, O Israel, today you're going into battle against your enemies. Hear, O Lanny. Hear, O Steve. Hear, O Lisa. Hear, O Yolanda. Hear, O... Put your name in there. Today you're going into battle against your enemies. And now he says four times basically the same thing. Listen to what he says. Do not be weak-hearted or afraid or alarmed or frightened. I am the Lord your God who goes with you to fight for you against your enemies. The battle's already won. We're on the victory side. And I will give you victory, it says here. You can see that in Psalm 18. I made a little note. I will give you victory against your enemies. Don't be weak-hearted or afraid or alarmed or frightened. And different translations have different words in there. But he's trying to hammer it home. Don't be afraid. Fear not. Fear not. Don't worry. I got it. Don't be anxious. I got it. How many times did Jesus say, fear not, fear not, fear not, fear not. I am with you. I am with you in the storm in the boat. I am with you. Fear not. Don't be afraid. I love it in verse 4. I will go with you to fight for you against your enemies. God's never lost a battle. Never lost a battle. He's never lost a battle. That's what it means to be on the victory side. Because that's where we are. In Nahum 1.9, so again, part of the healing scriptures, I'm just about done, just a couple more. In Nahum 1.9, it is he who will make an end. The enemy shall not rise a second time. This means stomp on the enemy, and if he tries to come back, remind him that he's already lost. The, the enemy shall not rise a second time. So, that cancer that's being, that's, that's been hanging on Steve will be gone by the power of the living God. The blood of Jesus Christ will be gone, and it will come back. Because when God takes it away, it can't come back. And he's doing the work. Right, Dale? He's doing the work. We're not. He's with us. And he guarantees us a victory. In Job 22, this jumps virtually all over the Bible, but these are things that Joanne had found as she put together the healing scriptures that I now I have a copy of, and that I use to remind the Lord his word, his promises. He doesn't need reminding, believe me. But like any dad, Abba, Jesus said he'd call him Abba, that means daddy. You can come in, sit on his lap, and say, Dad, you didn't forget that we're going fishing this, this weekend, did you? No, I, I didn't forget. But I love it when he comes and my, one of my kids or grandkids comes and sit on my lap and say, Grandpa, you didn't forget you're going to read the story to me today, The Snowy Day by Ezra Jack Keats. And I said, I promised I'd read that and I will. Let's do it right now. And in Job 22, 28, this is so simple, but listen. When you make a decision... It shall succeed for you, and upon your ways 
the light will shine. He will help us with our decisions. We don't always make the right decision. But even if we make the wrong decision, he'll shine a light unto our feet and unto our path, as it says in Proverbs, and show us what he plans for this. Now, I've made a decision that we need new tires, but I'm not sure how much I want to spend, and I don't necessarily want to spend more than we can afford with our budget and stuff. And so the Lord said, okay, you made a decision. Now I'll show you which ones I want you to have. They'll be the best ones that fit in your budget or whatever. Or he's promised to give me a long life. Maybe he could give my tires a long life. Speaking of which, I almost forgot. That was one of the other ones that I had written down of, of, a, of a minor miracle that happened to us because we've had a whole bunch of them. I've got a blank page in here where I wrote down all just kind of what I thought was miracles. For over 50 years, and it's just before Matthew's Gospel because there's a half a page, and I know just where it is, but listen to this. We went to bed one night, it was winter, and one of our tires was really, really low, front left. And I just uh, went out and shoveled around there hoping that I would, we wouldn't get drifted in so I could get to work the next morning. And so, and I looked down, and then I went around and got the snow away from it. I went, man, that's almost flat. What am I going to do? It's freezing out here. I got to be at work tomorrow at quarter to seven, and the, my tire's flat, and I don't even know if I can make it up the IVCC hill and get it without tearing it up or having something happen to it. You know, I always think, and the rim will ruin it. And I got up the next morning, and it was not only totally full, but I've got a little gauge in, my, in the glove compartment, one of those little tire gauges that you put on the valve, and it, and it shows you how much. It had 40 pounds of air. It had 40 pounds of air in the, in the tire gauge. That's impossible, but not for God. It's simple. So either he came or the angel or somebody came, filled it up, and then, I, I, then I'm, I'm, I'm driving over, and I'm just thinking, Lord, Lord, what, what, how come 40? We always put 32, 34. It's overinflated. And he said, I'm the God of the overflow. <laughs> you can go ahead and take out five pounds. He said, I just wanted to make sure you knew that it was me and that you weren't dreaming or that, some, that your neighbor didn't come and do it, you know. He said, I, I'm always extravagantly giving to you more than you could ask or imagine. Well, I just had these. I got halfway down, and we're going to close. We're going to close. Jeremiah 30, 17 says, Keep reminding the Lord of his promises. 1 John 3, 21 and 22, stand on his promises. Revelation 12, 11, plead the blood over all situations. Speak positively, your words have power. Share what God is doing in your life. And then at the bottom I put, there are many more promises. <laughs> These are some of the key ones. We just call them healing scriptures. What a mighty God we serve. We have no idea. No idea. I, I always do this. But I get so excited when I do. But I think about the, the size of the universe created by God. Even the atheistic scientists, astronomers say, you know, I don't believe there's a God, but it's amazing how orderly the universe is. The galaxies don't strike each other. They have their own space. Everything's constant. Einstein showed the warp and stuff in space. That's even mentioned in the, in the Bible. Spread out, your, spread out the heavens like a, like a blanket. And they've discovered that 
there's a blanket in space. It's so big, it can't be described. It's as big in our minds and in the minds of scientists, it's about as big as eternity is. Now, eternity is long. We cannot begin to imagine what trillions and trillions and trillions and trillions of light years mean. But God says, I put that out there for you so you can see how majestic and how powerful I am. And now I'm coming into your heart as the creator of the universe to help you get through the rest of your life. And we always say, what a mighty God. And Billy Graham said, you can't, there's no word to describe God. Mighty, awesome, all those words, they can describe a sunset or a painting or something. But they can't describe God. He's indescribable. He's so other that we don't understand. But we can understand part of who he is. Father, we thank you for this time together. We ask a blessing over each person here, each one watching online today, Lord. Let each one of us leave with at least something new, something a little bit better than, than we were when we got here. We can't imagine how much you love us. Brennan Manning said trying to capture your love is trying to capture Niagara Falls in a teacup. Your love is so powerful, so good. You love us more than we can imagine. Thank you for loving us. Amen. Go and be happy. Go and be happy and Remember that when you go out into the world, don't go out with a glum face. We're supposed to be joyful people. Right? We're joyful. The joy of the Lord is our strength. He wants us to be happy. He wants us to be joyful. I got our screensaver at home on our computer has a picture of Jesus dancing with a bunch of people. And, you know, if you go to Jerusalem at weddings and any celebration, the men all lock arms and they dance in circles. You can get, Google it online and put Jewish men dancing and you'll see them. They're all locked arms. I don't know what the women are doing, probably fixing dinner and for the men because they're going to be hungry after they get done dancing. But I got a picture of Jesus dancing and he's holding, no, he's holding hands with people, there might be a man on this side, a woman on this side, I don't know, but he's in the middle dancing. And the Lebanese people have a dance called the dubki, and that's when they do at weddings, and a lot of times men and women hold hands, and they make a circle, and they dance. And I've been to Lebanese weddings, so I've seen it, and uh, it's, Joanne's 100% Lebanese, so I've seen it a lot. And I'm not very good at it, but they kick, then they come back and stomp, then they take two steps and kick. Then they take two steps back and stomp. And they do this going around and around in a circle. And that's on my screensaver. And it shows Jesus dancing. He was happy. He was joyful. He danced at the weddings. He danced at the celebrations. The Jews have a lot of celebrations. God bless you. That was a little footnote.